There is so much of this design type out there in the world today that I guarantee if you do not know this, you will run into it sometime in your professional career. So this is something you're not gonna wanna miss. Today I'm providing a design example of a non-structural component, walking through the chapters of the ASCE 716 and ultimately getting you more familiar with non-structural component design. For this example, a mechanical unit. So we have the unit plan view. So it's a three by three in plan. That means looking down on it. There's four anchor points at its base. I'll make it a little more clear here. So they're down here in green. We have a unit elevation. So the center of gravity of the unit, which is what I'm denoting with that datum point, is located five feet above uh, the ground surface. Then we have a building elevation over to our right, which is uh, right here is our actual unit. And it's just a two story building, 12 feet each story. The total weight of the unit is 1000 pounds and I've denoted it as hospital critical air conditioner. So this is something that's gonna be um, needed to remain operational in a, you know, a post seismic event. And you'll see why that criteria is important in a second. We have an SDS of 0.71. And since this unit is indoors, we are only gonna be looking at anchorage design uh, for seismic. If it was on the roof or exposed to the elements, you would need to look at both cases between wind and seismic. But today we're just indoors. So first let's head to chapter one of the 716. Table 1.5-1 is where we find ourselves looking at risk categories based on our component type. And at the bottom, this is the bread and butter that we need from this section, which determines that we are risk category four. Buildings and other structures required to maintain the functionality of other risk category four structures. And this also applies to components. So like we said, this is, a, this is an important piece of equipment that in a hospital, Hospitals are uh, defined as uh, essential facilities, which is right here, which means that a hospital is a risk category for structure. And then that unit within that structure is needed to be operational in a post seismic event within that risk category for structure. So that means we need to, that means we need to design that component as a risk category for criteria. Table 1.5-2, Risk category four means that we have an importance factor of 1.5. We're gonna need that as well. We've got those tidbits of information. Let's now head over to chapter 11 to determine our seismic design category. Table 11.6, we're doing just that. We know we have an SDS equal to 0.71, which means that we fall under this criteria. And we know we've determined a risk category four, which means that we fall under Seismic design category D. Okay, from here on out, we're gonna be using chapter 13 mainly with a little bit into chapter 12. Chapter 13, for those of you that don't know, are the seismic design requirements for non-structural components, which is our topic today. Now, before we get going with design, you actually wanna stay on page one and check to see if you are potentially exempt from having to actually do structural engineering for your anchorage of your unit. If you do fall into the exempt category, that means that you as an engineer don't need to actually calculate and design anchorage requirements for the units. So you always wanna check these exemptions because if you're inside of them, then your job as the engineer is done. And what this passage is saying is that you are exempt if you're in seismic design category D and you're positively attached to the structure, so you do have some sort of anchorage, provided that either the component, which is our unit, weighs 400 pounds or less, well, our unit is a thousand pounds, so we don't work out there. Um, the center of mass is located four feet or less above the adjacent floor level, or we're five feet, so that doesn't work out there. And lastly, the importance factor is equal to 1.0, and that we also don't work out. We have an importance of 1.5. So strike three, we need to design this uh, anchorage, but that's okay, that's why we're here today, right? Next, let's jump over to 13.3. We now wanna find our horizontal force. F sub P is what it's called in this case, and you have the following equation given in 13.3-1, and then you have uh, maximums and minimums that you also need to check for. And then everything right below it all those variables are defined right here. So they do a great job of just giving all that info right in one place. Well, first let's find AP, RP, and Omega. 13.6 is mechanical and electrical components. We are uh, an HVAC unit, so that is mechanical. The 716 provides you this table, which defines A, R, and Omega based on your component type. And let's see, it's a big list, scrolls down here, distribution systems, 
uh, vibration isolated components and systems, mechanical and electrical components, and what we have today is an air side HVAC unit, because if you look further, you'll see that is defined as an air conditioning unit, which is what we have. So we get to use an A of two and a half, uh, an R of six, an omega of two. Let's see what else we need in our equation. Well, it's cool because we have everything else besides Z and H. And if we scroll down, Z and H are given right here. Z is the height and structure of point of attachment of component with respect to the base. Um, Z over H need not be taken greater than 1.0. And if your unit is located on the ground floor of something, then Z over H is just zero. And then H is defined as the average roof height of the structure with respect to the base. What does all that quite mean? Let me draw it out for you. This is why I drew that last elevation of the structure because we need that for this right here. So H is the overall average height of the building, which is two stories, 12 feet each. So H is 24 feet. And then Z is the point of attachment to the structure uh, relative to the base. So that's Z right there because we are anchoring again with green to that floor slab on the second floor. And that means Z over H is equal to 0 0.5. Now we have all of our components, plug everything in. All that gets is 474 pounds of lateral force uh, in each direction. FP min is 0 0.3 SDS uh, importance times weight. NFP max is 1.6 SDS times importance times the weight of your unit. Let's plug all that stuff in because we have everything. We have a minimum of 320 pounds and a maximum of, of 1,704 pounds. And what you do is you just need to make sure that your FP value that I circled in green falls between these two values. If it does, you can continue to use the FP that you have uh, calculated. If it falls outside of those bounds, well, say if it's 1,800 pounds, well, that means you only need to use a maximum of the 1,704 pounds. And if it's, if you found that it's 200 pounds, then you need to use a minimum of the 320 pounds, okay? But for us today, we are good to continue to use the 474 pounds. Now, this is only the horizontal component of the seismic demand on your unit. There's also a vertical component that you need to solve. Let's go check that out. We're still on the same page of the 716, chapter 13.3, and all we need to do is scoot up a little bit, and we land ourselves here, vertical force. And just to reiterate back, that equation that we just used is horizontal force. So they do lay it out pretty neatly for you. They're not trying to trick you up at all, obviously. And simply for vertical force, the component shall be designed for an, a concurrent vertical force of plus or minus, 0.2 SDS weight of your unit. Let's go plug that in. Since we're back here, I'm actually gonna slap on a little H uh, to our FP force, so that's horizontal. And then we're finding FP vertical, just to keep everybody super clear here. That equals 142 pounds, and that's in the vertical direction, up and down. And you're like, okay, I have all my forces, and so I can uh, design the anchorage, right? And still not yet. We still need to apply load combinations. And for us today, I'm gonna throw in a little curveball. I'm gonna say that your unit, so let's say there's like an L bracket, and then here's your unit right up top here, L bracket on each side, and for green for the anchors, we are doing post-installed epoxy anchors into concrete. And you're like, okay, well, why does that matter at all? Well, since you're installing uh, a post-installed attachment into concrete, that means you need to apply an overstrength factor. So that's our omega that we found before, okay? So let's jump over to chapter 12.4 to further refine uh, our loading criteria. We land ourselves here and we want uh, horizontal seismic load effects, uh, including overstrength. That's our equation right there. And if we look at QE, QE is equal to uh, the horizontal seismic forces of V, FPX, or FP. And that's dependent upon what analysis you're doing. Is it a building? Is it a non-building structure? Is it a, a structural component? They define the variable differently in each of those chapters. So since we're in chapter, so I guess I should say in chapter 12 for buildings that we've done before, that was your V that you were solving for. 
Um, in chapter 13, we're solving for f sub p. f sub p is just equal to qe. So this equation, qe equals f sub p. And then ev, as you can see, there's no real change. Actually, if you were to take your vertical seismic load effect per this chapter, it's the same exact equation. Um, and there's nothing that needs to change. No omega needs to get slapped on to the vertical component. EMH is equal to 2 times 474 pounds, which equals 948 pounds of horizontal force that we're designing for. So see how that got bumped up? It's pretty significantly. That we're going to box out because that is one of our final forces. EV is just equal to EPV, which we already found is 142 pounds up and down. That we're also gonna box. We're still not done, now we need to do load cases. Since we are anchoring into concrete, you know we're gonna need to do LRFD design. I'm not gonna flip us over, but you would check chapter two in order to get your load case that you'd use. In our case, we're only gonna check for one right now, but you would check for multiple. We're gonna do load case seven as our worst case uplift uh, condition so that would then result in the highest tensile force that is acting on an anchor. And you'll see why here. And here's our diagram all set up with our loads um, relatively applied to it. We just need to apply the actual values to them. 0 0.9, we know our dead load is 1,000 pounds. That's the weight of our unit. But we need to subtract out E sub V from that. So in this case, we can delete that and actually just have it pointing upward because we're subtracting. So we're saying that the, um, the vertical component of the seismic uh, demand is actually lifting that unit up, which is making it lighter, which is making the condition worse for overturning. EV is 142 pounds. It's gonna equal a net dead load of 758 pounds downward. And then EMH is 948 pounds. Let's now transform these loads into loads that are gonna be uh, experienced by each one of the anchor points. For that, we need to first find overturning, and let's take it about point A. So I'm gonna go right there. Your overturning is just EMH times five feet. And for those not following along, EMH is applied to your center of mass of your unit. And this, that is our datum that we give here. I'm gonna say center mass CM. That is almost always given by your unit manufacturer. So you're, you're given a unit and you're given a cut sheet that says all these different components and dimensions and weights and all of that stuff is within that cut sheet by, by the manufacturer that made that unit. And with that, they also give you a center of mass that you then use for your calculations like we're doing right now. That equals uh, 4,740 pound feet. Our resisting moment is just the net dead load, which is 758 pounds, with a moment arm of three feet over two. Not three and a half feet, three feet over two. Just wanna make that clear. That gets us 1,137 pound feet. So that we can say is this, this one we can say is that. That gets us a net overturning moment of 3,603 pound feet. Next, I've shown us a plan view and where our anchors are located. So we have four total, one in each corner. And I know that I said that the actual in-plan dimensions of the unit is three by three, and that means the anchors are gonna be sl spaced slightly less than that, you know, maybe two foot eight inches or something, which would change our calculations. But, but for simplicity's sake, just assume that the anchors are also spaced three feet apart, okay? To find your uplift, TU, that would be your net overturning moment divided by whichever way you're looking at it. And we're looking at demand moving um, from left to right. So your couple would be this three feet, which would then get you tension on those two anchors and compression on those two anchors. TU equals your net overturning moment divided by your couple of three feet divided by two anchors, which gets us 601 pounds, which we'll circle, per anchor. And we also need to account for shear that's gonna be resisted by those anchors as well. And again, you have your force moving left to right. And in this instance, all four anchors 
are going to resist shear uh, evenly, okay? So VU is just equal to um, your total horizontal seismic force, which we know is 948 pounds, and it's just divided by four anchors resisting that demand, which gets us 237 pounds per anchor. And what you would do from here is now take your anchor and it would be embedded in concrete and I said it's going to be like an epoxy ejected post installed anchor and you need to des uh, design each one of those anchors for an, uh, a tension and shear demand and you need to make sure that those anchors are sized appropriately for that demand and then you're done. We're not getting into anchor design today. I know, boo hoo, I'm sorry. This is already getting a little bit too long, um, but I hope this is super informative. This was more for, again, determining how you get your demand on your anchorage for a non-structural component per the ASCE 716 chapter 13. And this is, don't kid yourself, seismic design. It may not be this fancy big building, but this is stuff that still structural engineers and civil engineers uh, see every day and need to know how to do. So there is a huge, huge abundance for this type of work out there. You will come across it. And if you don't know it, uh, you're gonna fall behind a little bit, just in my opinion. So don't always think that you need to do the biggest and flashiest stuff out there. It's all about being kind of that jack of all trades and being exposed to a lot of things rant over. Hey, now come on close. Come right here. Yeah, that's it. Like the video, okay? If you found yourself learning something new, um, why not stay full time and get a reserved seat for yourself and subscribe down below. And if you're still curious about other uh, design examples and how to kind of gain more knowledge as a civil structural engineer, check out all of our other videos that I've posted throughout time uh, with similar design examples. This is Rich with Team Kesteva. Glad to see everybody here, and I'll see everybody next time. Later.